Good morning, everyone. Uh, if I've met you before, my name is Jason. I have the great joy, great privilege of opening up the scriptures to read them with you this morning. Uh, so if you've got the scriptures there, if you want to open them up to the book of John, uh, we are up to chapter 13, verse 18. Uh, Last week, we started looking at this long-running interaction between Jesus and his disciples uh, in the final days before his crucifixion. And we're going to be continuing uh, from verse 18. And this is Jesus speaking. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. When he had gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Thanks, Jace. Hey, my name's Tom. If I haven't met you before, I would love to do that after the service. Can I start by asking you a simple question? which is what are Christians known for? What is our reputation? Uh, let's say that in the area around us right now, Karingai, there's about 124,000 people living. You could very easily say that less than half of those people would meaningfully live as Christians, probably less than a quarter. You could keep going from there. And so we are the weird ones here sitting in a church today, either being a Christian or thinking about being a Christian. What do people outside of us think of Christians? What is the Christian 
um, reputation in the world. I, I imagine that depending on what circle you travel in, that actually might come on two different ends of the spectrum. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, people might say, oh, nice people. That's what Christians are. They're just nice people. On the other end of the perspective, you might encounter, oh, Christians are judgmental. That's their thing. All of that might even get wrapped up in that little phrase, phobic. You can put whatever you want at the front of that word. But this is our thing. Christians are the phobic people. I was talking to a couple of other people this week. What do you think of Christians? And I think this perspective on the screen captures it quite nicely. Uh, Somebody said, I'm not a fan of churches or church leaders, but not all Christians are like that. It's quite reasonable, seems to capture the sentiment at the moment. What are Christians known for? I ask that question because I think the high point of today's passage tells us what we're meant to be known for. Uh, John 13, starting in uh, verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one one another. That's what we're meant to be known for. The plan for today is we're just going to start at the start of that reading, verse 18, work our way through to the end. By the time we come back to the love passage, that's how you know we're starting to wrap up. That's the plan. Sound okay? Great. If you've got a Bible, you're going to be significantly aided by that. Verse 18. Uh, All of this is on the back of Jesus having washed people's feet uh, last week. It was good to have Jared preach for us. I'm not referring to all of you I know those I have chosen. Uh, He's not referring to all of them when he talks about verse 17. So that's the link to what we're doing today. But this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Uh, He's about to talk about one of his 12 disciples, Judas, is going to betray me. And he says that's actually the fulfillment of a psalm uh, that David wrote, Psalm chapter 41, and he's quoting from verse 9. David is lamenting that his enemies have turned against him. And Jesus said, that exact thing is about to happen to me. The significance of um, he who shared my bread is like the person who was at my table, the person who was in my house, the person who was genuinely very close to me is about to turn against Jesus. Verse 19. I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Um, The whole point of the book of John is to lead us to belief. That's chapter 20, verse 31. But if you just look in the bottom right-hand corner of all of these slides, you'll see a little logo there, yeah? See and believe. What we're meant to do when we read the whole book of John, and for the rest of this series, you can keep this in mind, is that uh, seeing Jesus clearly through these scriptures, we're meant to be led to belief. This is a good example of that. And I imagine that if you're here today, considering whether you want to stay a Christian, considering whether you want to become a Christian, tune into this bit. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you now, before it happens, that Judas is going to betray me, So that when it does happen, you will believe. If you want it in kind of a scientific looking formula, here's what it might look like. That the prediction, when it's fulfilled, is meant to lead us to belief. Do you find that to be compelling? Do you find it fascinating that Jesus is able to predict his own moment of betrayal? Verse 20. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. Whoever accepts me... Uh, accepts the one who sent me. Verse 21, after he'd said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Now, so far, we've actually had a fascinating image of Jesus, both his godness and his humanness on display. Um, Some people get caught when they think about the person of Jesus, a little doctrine side tangent here for us. Um, Jesus is God. And some people say, he's God, he's not a person. Some people go the other way. They say, he's just a person, he's not actually God. Some people say, oh, it feels like he's 50-50. But when you read the passage of this, when you read the whole scriptures, put them all together, you have to say, as mathematically improbable as it sounds, 
that Jesus is 100% God and he is 100% man, you see these two things on display in the passage already so far. You see Jesus being God, says, I can predict what's about to happen. You also, in this verse, see his humanity, where he is still troubled in spirit. He is distressed about the betrayal he is about to experience. And can I just take a little um, detour into your own life for a second and ask you a very personal question? I know it's 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever had somebody very close to you suddenly seem to turn out of nowhere? Jesus knows this is about to happen to him, and that feeling in your heart as you remember that He's feeling something very similar. Jesus was troubled in spirit. And he said, very truly, one of you is going to betray me. The fascinating insight at this point is to recognize that Jesus gets you. Jesus knows what it's like to be us. In our great moments and in even the depths of an experience like being betrayed. Verse 22, his disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. Verse 23, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, um, that's shorthand for John who's writing this, was reclining next to him. Um, In pictures of this, usually uh, you think of that the Last Supper in kind of Western art. Um, They're usually sitting at a table, but notice here it seems like they are reclining. Um, Simon Peter, verse 24, motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. And leaning back against Jesus, just think about the, what's actually happening at this circle that they're sitting in. Um, they're kind of reclining, and one of them is so close to Jesus that it says he leaned back against Jesus, and I take it that he said this quite quietly, and the rest of the group couldn't hear it. He said, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, I presume quietly as well, because that makes sense of what happens directly after. It's the one to whom I'll give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. I assume that it's quiet because if you were Judas and he just said, the one who takes the piece of bread, he's the traitor, you probably wouldn't stick your hand out and take it particularly boldly. But Judas doesn't seem to have heard what's happening. So dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. One of the things we can notice at this point is that a contrast between the betrayal you experienced and the betrayal Jesus is about to experience is that he's in control of being betrayed. It's fascinating, isn't it? When he says, what you're about to do, do it quickly. It's almost like you know, Jesus says, I know what you're about to do. I know you don't know that I know that you're about to do what you're about, but go do it. He's almost giving Judas license, like, I know, off you go. He's in control of his own betrayal. Verse 28, but no one under, under, at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, Some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. Fascinating to note that Judas was a trusted member of that church, if you want to use that language. Judas was the treasurer. They said, we trust this guy so much, we'll put him in charge of the money. Um, Sometimes you look around church and actually the first will be last and the last will be first. And many people who we thought, that person, great example of a Christian, you actually won't see them in the kingdom of heaven and vice versa. Many people who you think there's no way that person could possibly be saved. There will be great reversal, great surprise at that final day. So we come to verse 30. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Now, it was actually night. uh, And at the same time, what that is signaling is that a dark series of events has now begun to take place. We come to verse 31, and we'll camp out here for a little bit. When he was gone, so Jesus has waited for Judas. um, He's waited for his 12 disciples to become his 11. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified. What does that mean? How is it that Judas walking out to betray him means that Jesus, the Son of Man, 
is glorified. Uh, I take it that the now is talking about the series of events that has just been put into place. This is all going to snowball and snowball until eventually Jesus ends up being crucified. And Jesus is saying that the moment of his crucifixion and his subsequent resurrection coming alive again, that is a moment in which he's going to be glorified. It's fascinating. Uh, let's take a brain break. Let's talk about the Olympics. Nicola McDermott. Has anyone been following Nicola McDermott? She's uh, from the Central Coast, just an hour north of here. She's won two silver medals um, in the high jump. She's doing a pretty good job of representing her Christian faith on the global stage. If you notice, um, as she's biting down on her silver medal there, she's got a little Jesus tattoo on her wrist. If you notice around her neck, she's got a little cross. And on all of her socials, she's making a lot of noise about it. This really is her moment of glory, right? Getting two silver medals in the Olympics. And so I imagine that in a couple of years' time, if you went up to wherever she's living and you said, hey, what was the most glorious moment of your career? She might take you to a trophy cabinet and she would show you two silver medals. If you went to God and you said, what is the most glorious thing? What is the centerpiece of your trophy cabinet? I would expect that God would say creation. He would say, let me tell you about stars. Let me tell you about subatomic particles and how many of them I've made. Let me tell you about the complex interplay that keeps this whole thing going and scientific forces at play that we haven't even discovered yet. Let me tell you about my most glorious moment, the creation of the universe. That's why I put it on the very first page of the Bible. That's what I thought he would say. But if you're reading this verse and others like it, you actually come to the understanding that God's silver medal is creation, and his gold medal is a stinking piece of wood in the Middle East around about 30 AD with a guy dying on it. And he's like, that, that's my gold medal, centerpiece of my trophy cabinet. Jesus, verse 31, says, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. How can the cross be the most, how can that be more glorious than creation? It's because on the cross, that guy dying is dying for our sins, in our place, as our substitute. And anyone and everyone who puts their faith in him can experience a dramatic reversal of your eternal fortunes. And it's open to anyone, irrespective of age, gender, race, language. And it's the most glorious moment in all of human history. If you're um, thinking about whether you want to become a Christian, if you're considering the things of Christ, the cross is the centerpiece of everything. That's the place. And I would ask you, do you actually think that Jesus' death on the cross did anything? Do you actually think that it achieved anything? And will you put your faith in what he did on the cross, rising again later? To show that it worked. Verse 32. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. Now verse 33 says, My children, term of endearment, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. Um, that could mean either the cross or the ascension. He could mean you can't come to the cross with me. And he could mean um, I'm going to die, I'm going to be raised again, and 40 days later I'm actually going to ascend into heaven. That's where he is right now, by the way. And he's saying you can't come there. But in either case, uh, the next verse is the relevant bit because he's saying while I'm gone, here's my parting instructions. While I'm gone, here's what I want you to be getting on with. Verse 34. This is our climax for today. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. He said it three times. It's probably important. Let's zero in on it for a second. Can I ask you some detailed questions to help you make this text pop? Look at this, a new commandment I give you. In what sense is that new? 
If you're really across your Bible, you may know that in the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, chapter 19, it does say, love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus shows up and he says, a new commandment I give you, love one another. In what sense is that a new commandment? Have I got you confused enough? The answer is in the second sentence, as I have loved you. That's the new bit of the commandment. You walk around Sydney, for example, and actually love, everyone is generally in favor of love. This is not at all a particularly controversial message here today. What's specific and unique about it, though, is Jesus saying, I want your love for each other to be cross-shaped. I want you to love as I have loved you. And by the way, he's not just talking to the 11 remaining disciples. You get to John 17. He applies it to all who would believe. And I take it he's doing the same thing here. As I have loved you, it could point back to his whole life. It could point just a minute back to when he's just washed their feet. And so you bring in everything from last week's sermon. It could point forward, and they're going to understand in a couple of days, And point forward to the cross and say, I want you to love each other just like I did when I died for you. He's saying, as I have loved you. I think that's a higher call than the call to just love everyone like you would find in regular Sydney culture at the moment. He's saying, to the extent that I've loved you, in the manner that I've loved you, so you must love each other. That was the first thing I want to show you about these verses. It's a new command. Second thing I'd love to show you about these verses is he does say, love who? Love one another, which is a little bit strange. Uh, We're probably more comfortable with the idea of saying, love everyone. And right here, Jesus says, love everyone one another. I think he's talking you know, in the original context to those 11 guys. He's saying, I want you to love the other 10 guys in the circle who are not you. Um, applying that to us today, he does seem to be saying, Christians, I want you to give particular love to other Christians. Now, there are many other parts of the Bible where he talks about loving even your enemies, loving people who aren't believers. But right here, the focus is on loving each other. Now, I feel like every time I end up preaching a passage at this church, I end up giving a message about um, loving other people in the church, paying attention to other people in the church, paying attention to the person two rows behind you to the left. And I'm going to wave that flag again and say, other people matter. Other people, other Christians particularly. Sometimes, actually, this actually, this affects the way people do their giving. You might be saying, I'm going to give to a charity. Which charity should I give to? And lots of Christians end up using a verse just like this, and they'll say, hey, well, it looks like there is a priority to loving other Christians, so I'm going to particularly make sure that part of my giving is directed to meeting the needs of other believers who don't have enough. I think that's a pretty reasonable way to do it. And at this point, can I offer an objection? And we'll go a little bit deep on this one here. I imagine that there's some of us in the room who are experiencing quite an uncomfortable moment right now. Because we're talking about loving one another. We're talking about how the Christian church and all Christians towards all Christians, there's meant to be a relationship of love, but some of us are sitting here today and you're thinking, I don't feel loved. I don't feel like the Christian communities that I'm a part of are doing this very well. And it was actually pretty difficult for me to get here today. Maybe even you're tuning in online because you just think, I couldn't face up to showing up today. Because I'm not feeling loved like Jesus led me to expect I would within the Christian community. I want to say I'm so sorry if that's where you're at. I want to say good on you if you're feeling that way and you showed up today. Um, I want to address you particularly today if you're somebody who is feeling loved and you're feeling like the people at this church are lovely to me, I'm having a great time here, I would love for you to raise your eyes and recognize that you can have such a profound benefit to someone else's faith by deciding that directly after 
the service today. You're not going to talk to your regular people. You're going to search out somebody who you think maybe doesn't feel on the inner of what we're doing. I want to raise your eyes to care about the experience of other Christians. But hey, if you're here today, I'll return to you and you're not feeling the love. Can I just do something a little bit unusual and articulate to you that this could be your superpower? Not feeling loved in the Christian community can become your superpower. How? Because you know what it feels like. And so more than somebody who has been around the church and feel comfortable for the last 30 years, if you're feeling kind of new, you're feeling on the outer, that can be your superpower in relationship to you noticing that in other people, caring deeply about them, and actually sometimes the best welcomers, sometimes the best integrators, sometimes the best, most loving people are like that because they know what it's like to not be loved. As painful as it is, this can become your superpower. Love to chat more about that after church, if that's where you're at. Can we bring this to a close? Verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. I would have thought that he might have gone with like miracles or something. If you want to designate somebody as your disciple, you give them the ability to do miracles. And then you say, look, see, that guy's obviously my disciple. He doesn't do that. He says, how am I going to designate my own? How are outsiders looking in going to know that person's a Christian? By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He's saying the mark, the externally observable mark of an individual Christian as well as a Christian community is meant to be love. If we go for the scientific diagram thing again, when you see love, it's meant to lead to belief. When you see a bunch of people loving each other in Jesus' name, what an attractive force that is. Can I tell you a cool story? Um, a, a glimpse of this that I've experienced at church myself. Um, Bree and I have only been here for about a year and a half. Um, we had a little girl, Ava, and when she was born, we were maybe three, four months into our time at this church. And there were people dropping off meals left, right and centre, people who I'd never met from all of the different congregations just dropping off meals. And it wasn't for one week, two weeks. It was like two months. It was amazing. And I had a friend who had a kid at a very similar time. He doesn't do church. And he was like, oh, man, the cooking is killing me. And I was like, oh, you should join a church. I've been getting all these meals. I dropped up. <laughs> and he was like, what is this? You don't even know those people. I was like, yeah, it's great. Um, th there are some really beautiful glimpses of Christian community in place. That's just one that I've experienced. Can I leave you with this? What are Christians known for? What is the mark of a Christian band? You guys can come up. It's meant to be love. Let me pray. God, we love you and we recognize that you loved us first. And we um, repent we say sorry today, recognizing that so often our individual lives and our together lives are not marked by love. God, please change us. Help us to deeply understand what Jesus did for us and his example to us, as well as his empowering to do it. We ask that we would become a loving people, so loving that people from the outside would even be able to look in and observe that. And everybody who agreed said... <laughs>